recording. Okay, so today's last day of class, so I'll have a slightly different format. So um, I spent about an hour going over some sort of application material and, and sort of the future of MRI. Then we'll um, take some time to then sort of do sort of uh, end of course logistics, including talking about the project. Um, so before we start today, are there any general questions about the course or where we're going or uh, homework seven, I guess, or course material? No? Okay, well, if anything comes up, let me know. So today we are going to um, talk about diffusion imaging, uh, phase contrast, and time of flight angiography. Uh, and then it says portable MRI, but it's more just sort of, it's not limited to portable MRI, it's sort of just sort of what you might be seeing in MRI in, in, the, in the future years. So just to remind you where we were last time, we want to talk a little bit of, or give you a little bit of sense of what MRI can do when things are moving, okay? And so um, uh, the two things we're gonna look at today is what happens when water moves, and then what happens in terms of random motion of water, and then also what happens with blood flow, and how do we use MRI to look at that? Because those are obviously two very important things that go on in biological tissue. So you remember from last time, the basic idea is if you have spins in the presence of gradients, and these are very, these are what we call bipolar gradients, where we turn them on for a certain amount of time, then we wait, and then we turn them in the opposite direction for the same amount of time, and then we see what happens. And what we found was that because spins are moving around, they're experiencing different parts of the magnetic field that we've actually imposed, this linear varying, linearly varying magnetic field. And so then even when we refocus it, okay, so if the spins stayed where they were, they would acquire no net phase because whatever uh, additional field we gave them, we subtracted it later and the field balanced out. But if they move around, they actually move and sample different parts. So they're not going to get rebalanced. And so they are going to acquire a net phase. All right. And that's why we spend so much time talking about phase. The MRI portion, because understanding phase is really important to understanding what these spins are doing. So then what happens is at the, at the end of the experiment, we have phases, spins that are out of phase. All right. And so that means when we sum up all the spins in any given voxel, the more out of phase those spins are, the more they're going to cancel out and the signal is going to be smaller. So you would expect that as the diffuse, as spins can diffuse more, or we wait longer for spins to diffuse, they're going to get more out of phase. Okay. This is just another picture. Now we're starting to see um, the, let's see, I should get this to the back going. Okay. So this is what the tip of the diffusion pulse sequence looks like. It's um, you typically have a 90 degree pulse and you apply the gradient uh, in one uh, direction, sort of say a positive gradient. You'll wait some amount of time for diffusion to occur and then you'll apply another gradient to refocus. So anything that has not moved in this time will just see the sum of these two, which is zero. So it's no net phase. But if I move around during that time, then I will have a net phase. So these spins didn't move, so they don't have any net phase. This spin moved, so it has a net phase, all right? So you can imagine the longer we wait, the more things should get out of phase, okay? So that's under our control. So we can sort of tune our sequence to be more sensitive to diffusion by letting this time increase. The other thing we can do is increase these gradients, right? And so um, the bigger we make these gradients, the, the more field is different across space. And so that's also gonna cause more dephasing. So, one of the ways you can tell, like if you're lying in a scanner, sometimes the way you can tell whether what type of sequence it is, is by listening to these gradients. Okay. And so people who have been in the scanner a lot, like myself, we can sort of tell what scans are being done just by listening to the, the scanner and what sound it's making. Diffusion gradients, we typically tend to use really big gradients to turn them on and off. So those tend to be very loud scans, all right? Uh, this is just another picture showing um, that we turn on the gradient and then we reverse it. There's this mixing time now, which we're calling delta, okay, and the size of the gradient. And it turns out that the signal then is proportional to the exponential minus b times d 
whereas D is the diffusivity, okay? So the more diffuse things are, the bigger BD is gonna get. So the signal's gonna go down because E to the minus BD, right? B is what we control, and that's related to sort of how strong the gradient is and how long we wait. Okay, so the G squared and the delta term. So the bigger we make the gradients, the bigger B is gonna be. And that makes sense because then the, the signal's gonna die more quickly because we have bigger gradients. Okay, similarly, if I make delta bigger, that's also gonna make B bigger. And that makes sense because the longer I wait for spins to diffuse, the more they can get out of phase. Right? So that's just sort of, um, when we talk about diffusion, the term B factor is used quite a lot. This was what we looked at last time. So we said that one of the major uses of diffusion imaging clinically is to look at stroke, okay, so, or dead tissue. Um, and it turns out that um, empirically, what's been observed for many years is um, uh, basically uh, the, the, this tissue that's damaged appears brighter on what's called a DWI or diffusion weighted image. And um, that's because the diffusion here is less. If we look here at what's called the apparent diffusion coefficient map, you'll see here that ADC or the diffusivity is lower in this region than it is in the surrounding tissue. So we have lower diffusivity here, okay, which means there's gonna be less dephasing. So therefore the signal can be bigger where there's tissue damage. This was the other example we looked at where once again, this person unfortunately had a stroke and lots of um, cell damage here. And here's the angiogram, which we'll talk about uh, further later in the slide, in the, in the lecture in terms of how do we actually make something like this. Um, but once again, um, the restricted motion of water makes it so the diffusivity is less here. So the signals can be brighter. Um, so these are, let, let's just do a couple of these questions. Um, so I'm gonna set, do a poll and then we'll just do the in-class poll here. Let me see if I can do, if I do the polls. Yeah. Okay, we'll launch the poll online. So there's only two choices, so just pick either A or B or increase or decrease. Sorry, I think I've an increase or decrease poll. So let me actually bring that up. Okay, so now basically you're, you're at the MRI scanner and um, you've got some, someone in the scanner and somehow you increase the amplitude of your diffusion gradients, okay? And then you look at this area where there's maybe a stroke. What can you say about the magnitude of the, the diffusion weighted signal in that area? Will it be bigger? Will it get bigger or will it, will it increase or decrease? So that's the signal you're measuring, okay? Now the gradients are higher. Go ahead and take about a minute to think about that. Okay, it's a pretty good response online. So let's let's see what people in class think. So just at the count of three, just yell out increase or decrease. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, so I thought I think it was mostly decrease, maybe a little bit increase. Uh, your your comrades on Zoom are split 50-50. Okay, so that means at least I haven't done anything bad. I haven't caused you to think something wrong, but I've done no better than chance. So. Uh, that's always very humbling. So let's talk about what's going on here. Um, 
So remember, uh, so let's just think about it intuitively. So I increase the gradients, right? The amplitude of the gradients. So that means that the fields are much different across space, right? And so that means spins as they're moving around can get out of phase much more easily. And so the more out of phase things are, the more the signal will tend to decrease, okay? If we want to look at from an equation point of view, we have e to the minus bd, signal is proportional to that, okay? And we said that b was proportional, for example, to g squared times delta, where delta is the spacing and g is the amplitude of the gradient. So obviously, if we make g bigger, then b is going to get bigger, and so e to the minus bd has got to go get smaller, okay? Okay, why don't we um, push our luck and try the next question. Okay, so now we are at the scanner and someone's increased the spacing between the gradient pulses. So you have a positive and negative pulse. You've increased that spacing. Now what's gonna happen to the diffusion weighted signal? Go ahead and take a minute to think about that. Sorry, we decreased the spacing. I read it wrong. Okay, let's do, let's see, pretty good response online. So let's see what people in class think. So on the count of three, just say increase or decrease. One, two, three. Increase. Great, okay, so increase and your online compatriots, 75% also say increase. So that's better than chance, so that's good. All right, so that's true. So if we decrease the spacing between those gradients then they don't have as much time to diffuse, right? So they're not going to get us out of phase. So therefore the signal will increase, all right? So that's just sort of basic sort of how to think about diffusion uh, imaging. Any questions on that? Okay. So now we're going to get into, I think, what, one of the cooler aspects of MRI, which is how do you actually use MRI to map the wiring in your brain in vivo? Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to sort of build up some intuition about what's called DTI, diffusion tensor imaging. Okay. And so the basic idea is that if I had diffusion in like free water or free diffusion in, in a big sort of container of like water or something, or, or even in this room, the diffusion is relatively free, right? Spins or particles can just go in any direction they want, right? But now let's say I, um, you know, there's a closet back there. So we made there's a closet where there's equipment. So let's say I opened a bottle of perfume in my closet, right? Now that's called restricted diffusion, right? Because this, the, the particles can't get outside that box. Right, so the profile is going to look very different. In this room, it'll be relatively Gaussian until it gets to the walls, and then it'll be stuck. So the more barriers I have, or let's say I put a lot of people in this room, or we stack lots of stuff in this room, this, the particles can't go around as easily. So there's not going to be free diffusion. Okay. So um, in this case, for example, let's assume we had a bunch of long, sort of cylindrical barriers in my environment, then it's going to be hard for spins to diffuse this way, easier for spins to diffuse that way. Okay. And so that's what's called anisotropic diffusion. There's preferred direction. Isotropic means any direction is okay. Anisotropic means you're more relatively likely to have higher diffusivity this way and lower diffusivity that way. And typically you'll see a lot of these ellipsoids. So a, a very first order approximation is to represent it as an ellipsoid, sort of the, the diffusivity surface. So how do we measure diffuse, diffusion in different directions? Well, the cool thing is we can do that with magnetic gradients, right? So 
basically, um, the, the, the bottom line is that um, if I apply gradient where the field varies this way, then I'm only going to be sensitive to diffusion as, as particles moving in this direction. Because I'm only sensitive to this direction of diffusion, right? Because that's the only thing I'm varying the magnetic field in this direction, right? So if things vary along this way, I'm not sensitive to that diffusion. Okay. Because this, the the along this direction, the fate that there's no difference in magnetic field. Right. So the MR is not going to be too sensitive to that. So I want to be sensitive to this direction, I better apply the magnetic field gradient along this direction. Okay. And if I can do it in that direction, obviously I can do it in any direction. So what diffusion does is we apply gradients in different directions to be sensitized to diffusion along different axes. All right, so for example here, if I have a horizontal gradient, meaning this way, I'm sensitive to um, diffusion as particles are changing in this direction, okay? So there'll be signal loss, but for vertical motion, I'm not gonna have any signal loss. But if I apply a vertical gradient, I'll be, I won't be sensitive to horizontal motion, but I will be sensitive to vertical motion. So we'll be signal loss that way. So we can sort of see that here. If we zoom in here and look at um, this area. So here is one area where there's, there's fiber bundles in your brain that are sort of going in this direction. Okay. So you can sort of see here, when we apply a gradient this way, this area here is pretty dark. Okay, because there's a lot of diffusion going this way, back and forth across the fibers. But if I apply diffusion in this direction here, there's not so much, the signal is much brighter, right? Because spins are not really diffusing very much along against the fibers. Okay, so right there, the fibers are running this way. So most of the diffusion is this way. There's very little diffusion this way. Okay. Similarly, if I put the gradients in plane, so now, the variation is perpendicular to the plane, you notice this whole fiber is very bright, all right? Because that fiber is like this and all the water is moving like this here, okay? It's not moving this way, right? But I tied the gradient this way. So that means that's why that looks so bright. So you can sort of see here, just by changing the direction of the gradient, I can make that diffusion weighted imaging image look very different. Question. You mean these two lines? No, no, go up, more. up more? Like, like, like the, the two dark, uh, bright spots in the middle. Like, these uh, things? Yeah, those things, yeah. Okay. They kind of start to go like this way. Yeah, um, that just means that there is some, I mean, there's, in the brain, you have like big bundles and you have lots of little fibers. And so that means that there's probably some small fibers here that are going in that direction. Yeah. And so you sort of see, and interesting enough, it goes dark here when they go through plane. So now you would conclude that there's probably some fibers going through plane there. Yeah, so the diffusion gives you a lot of information about what's going on with the fibers, okay? Um, yeah, I don't, that's basically going to be the same thing. So I think that was a good example. So the idea is, let's say we want to characterize an ellipsoid. And so you would think that really, I mean, for ellipsoid, you only need three principal axes, right? And so for a 3D ellipsoid, so you'd think you can, uh, you could get away with just, uh, as in, you know, doing three directions, right? But it turns out no one really does that typically we do at least six directions, okay? And part of the reason for that is that um, uh, basically three is not really, if you have measurement error, then three is really not enough to characterize the distribution. So here's an example here. So three, obviously three axes, these arrows definitely fit this pretty well, okay? But let's say you sort of change the, um, uh, ellipsoid a little bit such that it goes from this dash thing to this blue thing. Okay. So now that's going to um, make this a little more difficult to sort of to get the right value. So you're going to fit this ellipsoid instead of the dash ellipsoid. So the more measurements you have, then it just makes me more robust against error, any one measurement being off. 
Okay, if you only have three measurements, if one is off, it's really gonna change you. But if you have like seven or eight or even 20 measurements, then things will average out and you'll still be able to get the D looks like. So when you look at diffusion imaging, you'll wonder why do they take so many directions? And part of the reason is you're less sensitive to measurement error. So we're just gonna go through some terminology. We're not, obviously this last lecture, so you're not gonna be tested on this, but just it's good to sort of know what these things are. So if you do hear about this, you sort of know what people are talking about. You'll hear a lot about people talking about the diffusion tensor. Okay, and so in fact, this is called diffusion tensor imaging. And all that means is that we're trying to characterize this three by three tensor or matrix in this case. So we're looking at diffusion along the X direction, the Y direction, the Z direction, and also the X, Y direction and the X, Z direction and the Y, X. And it turns out that matrix is sufficient to characterize ellipsoid in any direction, okay? Because you have all the sort of the principal terms and you have all the cross terms. And so you can basically, um, uh, use this to um, characterize anything. And then if you know, if you think back to linear algebra, right, one of the big things in linear algebra is diagonalizing matrices, right? I mean, and those are the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues, right? So it turns out that then the eigenvectors of this matrix tell you what those principal directions are, okay? And the eigenvalues tell you how big they are, right? And so, um, for example, this has the biggest eigenvalue, and so this is saying most of the diffusion occurs along this dominant eigenvector. So when people look at diffusion imaging measures, then they base them a lot on the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. But you can just sort of think of this physical picture. Those are just telling you about those principal axes of the ellipsoid, telling you, is there, for example, if all the eigenvectors have the same value, that means it's isotropic, right? Because all the axes have the same length. Uh, so all, all eigenvalues being equal just means it's isotropic. Right. If one eigenvalue is really big and the other two are small, you know you have very isotropic diffusion because that means most of the principal axis is really big and the other two axes are pretty small. Um, this is just showing that, for example, these three guys all have, if you look at their eigenvalues, they're all the same, right? Because they all have the same shape, right? So the only thing that's different is they're rotated, right? And so that means, and so now if you look at their eigenvectors, they're all pointing in slightly different directions. Okay. So we'll use the eigenvectors to do sort of what's called mapping. Sort of, we're gonna follow the eigenvectors. In fact, we're gonna follow the principal eigenvectors to sort of track, to sort of estimate which way water is going. So that will be like along the principal axis. We'll use the eigenvalues to tell us how ellipsoidal this thing is, right? So if these are all the same, then it's gonna be very circular. And if they are very different, it'll be more ellipsoidal. And that's a measure of anisotropy. So these are some things that you might hear about if you go into this area. So um, you'll hear things like the trace of the matrix or FA, which is fractional anisotropy. So that's defined here, or relative anisotropy or volume ratio. And you'll also see these cool color maps. So we'll just go over one of these, which is FA. So FA is a pretty standard use of, and this is basically telling you how anisotropic is the diffusion. So you can sort of see everything you're seeing here that has high FA is pretty much your white matter. Okay, and in fact, and it's very strong here in the corpus callosum areas uh, here. Um, these sort of things are connecting the hemispheres. Uh, it's, yeah, I, I forget the name of these, but, um, and you can sort of see the areas here in the gray matter, there's not so much fractional anisotropy. So that means that the white matter fibers, you, as you'd expect, are very anisotropic. And if you look at the uh, how this is defined, you're basically looking at the difference of the eigenvalues. Okay, so the more different they are, then the more anisotropic you would say your uh, diffusion is. Okay. The other thing you can do is um, for every voxel, you can sort of use those eigenvectors to figure out which direction the water is going principally. And then you can sort of just start tracing them and following and trying to figure out where things are going, all right? So that's called tractography. Um, this is another example here where um, you sort of, let's zoom in on this. I think that's as much as in. So 
Um, I guess it shows up pretty well there. So here you can sort of see, I sort of lied to you. These do not look like ellipsoids, right? And that's because with ellipsoids, you're limited, right? Because if you have two fibers that are crossing in a voxel, the diffusion is not going to be ellipsoidal. It's going to be more like a cross. So it turns out that if you want to, and in, in the brain, there's a lot of crossing fibers, right? So if you only did what we said was a traditional, like say seven measurements, you wouldn't be able to resolve these crossing fibers. Or sometimes there's even kissing fibers, fibers that go like this. Okay, those are called kissing fibers, right? So there's crossing fibers, kissing fibers, there's lots of U-turn fibers. The brain just does everything, right? There's this messy wiring diagram. So it turns out that people do lots and lots of direction. And so they go even beyond what we're talking about here. They go beyond the diffusion center to try to characterize um, the, uh, the water, even when it's crossing in a voxel. And so once you have that, then you can actually resolve, for example, things like this, where these are two crossing fibers. And now instead of ellipsoids, sometimes you have crossing ellipsoids. Okay. So that's just sort of more advanced um, diffusion, image, diffusion tensor imaging, where you just have more voxels, more, more diffusion directions. And what you get then at the end of the day is then you can make these um, really nice images of the human brain, the wiring. Uh, these, I showed these to you, I think, the first lecture, but I, I think they're worth showing again. The remarkable thing about these are these are, um, I think this is about two or three millimeter isotropic resolution, uh, probably about two millimeter. And these are done completely without any contrast agents. So this is simply putting a normal human being into the scanner for, and, and after eight minutes, you can get something like this, after 11 minutes, and after 25 minutes. And there's really no other way to get this information okay, in vivo. This is really the only way you can do that. Okay. Um, you know, previous to this, when people were trying to track fibers, the only thing you might do is, for example, if you had a mouse or a monkey, you might be able to inject contrast agent into one part of a fiber and wait for it to fuse slowly and see where it went. But obviously, you can't do that without hurting the patient. And it takes forever and only gets you one fiber. This is pretty amazing because it gets you all the fibers all at once. Okay. Question. Uh, do we need to do this for a diagnostic purpose or just purely uh, visual? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say that they're primarily research now. Um, the diffusion temperature imaging, diffusion sensor imaging is people are looking at, at things for things like you know degenerative disease clinically or TBI, but I think it's still on the research side. So um, clinically, it's it's not, um, you're, there's still probably the most common thing is still diffusion weighted imaging to look at stroke and things, yeah. Um, now, there might be some, um, you know, as these techniques get better, you know, I, I imagine there will be some clinical adoption, but for now I would say they're still primarily uh, research. Uh, this is an example of some research where they're looking at fibers in a two-week-old, a one-year-old, and a two-year-old, and you can sort of see uh, when you're very young, the the brain hasn't really connected itself, right? And it's with over time as you're developing that the um, you really see these these brain parts get connected to each other. And this process of the brain connecting itself, making all these connections. Uh, the, the latest estimates, I think, typically say that that, that process, at least biologically, um, seems to go on until you're about 25 years old. Okay. And this is something that I think the insurance, the car insurance companies discovered this many years ago, just using statistics, because they would never insure, especially a male under the age of 25, or it's very difficult to, you know, uh, your insurance rates go really, are really high until you hit about 25. Okay. Um, and, and also, you know, it's very difficult to rent a car, right, um, until you're of a certain age. Um, and so, um, this may, or, this may have some sort of correlation to sort of when the brain is fully wired, uh, especially one of the last areas of the brain to get really fully wired is your prefrontal cortex, which is a lot of decision-making, all right? Okay, so, um, why don't we just do one of these questions? Let's just do the first one. So 
Um, as diffusivity becomes more isotropic, the fractional anisotropy will either increase or decrease. So let's just go ahead and think about that. And Okay, we have pretty good response online. So let's sort of see what the uh, in-class population thinks. So um, so on the count of three, just say increase or decrease. One, two, three. Okay, great. So it's sort of overwhelming for decrease and online 67% said decrease. Okay, so yeah, decrease is the right answer. So as things become more exotropic, that means there's no preferred direction for diffusion. Therefore, any measure of anisotropy should probably decrease. And in fact, if you, what we said again is as, as that ellipsoid becomes more isotropic, all the eigenvalues become similar. And so if you go back and look at that expression for FA, all those lambda one minus lambda two, lambda two minus lambda two, they all go to zero, right? And so if something is purely, is completely isotropic, then the FA will actually go to zero, right? Okay, so that's it for diffusion. Just obviously, you know, can learn a lot more about diffusion, but that's just sort of touching the surface. So any questions before we move on? All right, so if not, then let's talk about blood flow or any flow. It could be blood flow, CSF flow, any flow. So now we're gonna think about something a little different, which is instead of random motion, we're gonna think about what happens to spins as they keep going in the same direction at a certain velocity. We'll start off with the same picture, and one of these spins will move, this one will move, and this one will stay stationary. Okay. Um, so this stationary spin in the presence of a gradient field will require some phase. This spin is actually moving into a stronger part of the field. Okay, so this is represented by the gradient. So it's going to require even more phase. Then we play the same game as we did with diffusion. We reverse the gradient at some point and wait about the same amount of time. This spin that didn't move gets refocused, right? So it has the same spin as it started off with. This spin here, he keeps moving into an even stronger part, but now it's reversed, right? So if he had stayed here, then it would be refocused, right? Because then he would be experiencing this phase and it would be primarily refocused, not completely. But since he keeps moving out into this part of the phase, he gets more refocusing than he needs. And so he, he ends up sort of overshooting and acquires the next phase. Right. So what this means is that the more, it, it turns out that there's a relationship between velocity and phase. So we can measure the phase of a spin, then we can measure its velocity. The way we do that is we go back to our original equation of what's phase. And phase is just the integral of my frequency, which is just gamma times whatever delta B I have, which is gamma times the gradient. So before we had G dot R and we didn't have this tau in it. But now we're gonna replace this R vector with an X of tau, Y of tau, Z of tau, allowing things to move as a function of time. And if we do that, and we'll take the simplest case where we take very simple motion of something that's got some velocity and some acceleration. And if you do that, you can write that phase in terms of the position m zero times the first the zeroth order moment, which is just the integral of the gradient, plus the velocity times the first order moment, which is the gradient times time integrated over time. So this is the first order moment of the gradient and then acceleration over two times the second order moment, where it's just this gradient times t squared integrated over time. Okay. So it turns out that if we can set up our thing such that 
for example, M0, if we make that zero, then we're not sensitive to the position. If we make M1 um, non-zero, then we can be sensitive to velocity. And if we make M2 zero, then we can be not sensitive to acceleration. Or if we want to be sensitive to acceleration, we can make M2 something that's uh, non-zero. So that this is once again just describing how the zeroth order moment, first order moment, second order moment. This we've already talked about quite a bit because that's the integral of the gradient. So when we talk about k space, we've already talked about you know integrating the gradient. This is just different. It's integrating the gradient but multiplying it by time at the same time. Okay. So this is very similar to the first order moment you have in mechanics, where for example, if this to look, figure out the first order moment of this pencil. You take each position multiplied by its mass. Okay. And so this, for example, um, has a first order moment around if if these if this if there was a little more weight here, if there was weight, if I had weight hanging here and weight pushing there, then this would have a pretty strong first order moment because it would tend to rotate. Okay. Same thing with the gradients. This has its first order moment. So it's got zero, the zeroth order moment is zero, right? Because these gradients balance. The first order moment, if you imagine this as weight, you know, imagine this is sort of representing force going this way and this representing force going this way, right? If I imagine these as forces, then that would typically have, that would have a very strong first order moment, okay? So you can sort of, when you look at a set of gradients, if they look like that, you know they have a very strong first order moment. It turns out we can write an expression for that first order moment uh, as g naught t squared. So the bigger we make the gradient, the bigger the first order moment, the bigger we make t, the bigger the first order moment, all right? And so typically what's done is we'll acquire a set of gradients, so we'll acquire a phase with the gradients going one way, and we'll acquire one estimate of phase, and then we'll do the gradients the other way, acquire another estimate of phase, and if we subtract the two, then we end up with something that's proportional to our gradient and our t squared, but it's also got this velocity term. In it. So then we can solve for velocity in terms of the phase. Okay. Um, and so that's what this looks like here. And so for example, here, what you're seeing is uh, we're looking at um, phase contrast of um, blood going in the carotids. So black here represents blood going up into your brain. Okay. And White here represents blood going away. So those are your jugular veins. And then these things here are your vertebrals, which are sort of back here, and then they, they also represent. So you have two major, uh, so the carotid, the vertebrals deliver blood to your brain and the jugular drains it away. And so here, this is darker than this. That means the blood flow in your carotids is higher than the blood flow in your vertebrals. And then relatively speaking, there's also slower flow in their jugulars coming out as opposed to the carotids. Uh, you can also map this over time. And so this is showing you the velocities as a function of centimeters per second. You can sort of see this is the left and right carotid arteries. And you're sort of seeing blood flows, you know, up to about 45 centimeters per second. This is over a heartbeat or the digital part of the heartbeat. And then here in the vertebrals, you actually see much about half velocity of flow. So this is done with an acquisition where we do this measurement at different parts of the cardiac cycle. So we can sort of see how velocity is changing over time. Um, this is another example where um, you're showing here, these are showing blood. The, here we're sensed, as with diffusion, we can be sensitive, depending on how we set up our gradients, we can look at blood flow in different directions. And so for here, we're sent, we have the gradient going this way. So we're mostly sensitive to blood going either this way or that way. So most of the blood here is flowing this way. Okay. Here we set up the gradient to be sensitive to flow this way. So we're getting positive flow this way, negative flow that way, because the blood vessels are going like that. Um, you can do even, as we said, you can do this over time. And so you, if you put everything together, you can measure the blood flow in all different directions and measure the different parts of the cardiac cycle. And if you put together all that data together, you can make these sort of really amazing movies 
uh, this is called 4D flow. Okay, so you're looking at uh, the flow of blood through the heart. Uh, an acute anecdote is um, the first time we offered this course many years ago, one of the students in that course went on to become a radiologist, is actually now on the faculty and actually started a startup company that actually does this. And they basically, the MRI system send us all the data up to the cloud, they create these images really quickly, and so the, 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 the radiologists can look at that and then they, they can look at the blood flow in, in the heart. Okay. Um, one thing we want to talk about is we talked a lot about phase, and so the thing is, if, if blood goes one way, the velocity, you know, there'll be phase this way, and then if there's phase if velocity the other way, the phase will go the other direction. But in certain cases, as you notice, you know, you can go once you go past this point, then you're, in, you know, if, if I go along here, and this is positive velocity, but then if I cross this point, now I can interpret that as negative velocity. Right, so this is aliasing in, in phase contrast and geography. And so that's shown here where I have this pulmonary artery here where it looks like there's blood going in two directions okay, within the artery itself. Now, if that were really true, that would be really bad, right? Because it means you've got something going wrong with that artery. You've got some weird flow in the artery. And if you thought that was the case, then you might have you might recommend surgery or, or some other uh, follow-up. But that would be the wrong diagnosis, right? Because what's happened is, whoops. This is just an artifact of the imaging, okay? These velocities, the, the white velocities here are stuff that's had flow that's so great, it's, it, the phase has gone into the negative part. So what you want to do is you want to actually change the parameter to make that phase less or so that you don't, your, your greatest velocity will never cross that point. And when you do it there, then now you don't have that aliasing. Okay. So this is an important thing for, for example, the radiologist or the technician to know that they've set up what's called their VE and C factor, some called the bank factor, which is basically the velocity at which you hit 180 degrees of phase. So in this case, the bank was set too low. It was set at 15 centimeters per second. So that means that anything more than 15 centimeters per second got aliased into the wrong direction. So when they reset it to 30 centimeters per second, then it looks okay. So that's why sort of, you know, radiology is one of those things where there, there does have to be some knowledge of sort of the acquisition process and, and sort of the, what's going on behind the scenes so you don't make a misdiagnosis. Um, so this is just showing with, even within an artery, right? I mean, you could have velocities that are aliased in the middle and not aliased at the borders if you have, for example, laminar flow in this vessel. Okay, we're gonna skip these questions. I'm sure you won't mind. And um, we're gonna go into one last way of looking at blood flow, which is, um, uh, is what's called the inflow effect. And, and this is sort of, I want to state this, which I think is a really important point that I'm not sure what the percentage is, but a lot of things that are used clinically now started off as artifacts. Like people have acquired images, like, oh my God, you know, the vessel looks really bright on this image. This is terrible. You know, we need to figure out how to get rid of this, right? But then someone else comes along and says, well, actually that's really useful because I really want to see the vessels, okay? So it turns out a lot of the mistakes actually turn out to be the solutions. And so, when you're doing your research or when you're working, you always want to sort of keep an eye out for things that don't make sense because that actually can be your, your treasure. Right? And so um, this inflow effect in some parts of MRI is considered an artifact, but in this application, it is actually the signal you care about. Right? And so this inflow effect, how does that occur? Well, imagine you've got a vessel here and you're applying RF pulses all the time here, all right? So RF pulses, they keep tipping the spins down, right? And so that's sort of saturating the spin. And so you're gonna have less signal in this area. But anything that's flowing in doesn't see all those R pulses. And so they, it tends to not have that. It, it's, it's sort of fresh magnetization that's coming in. Okay. So if you had a sequence where you're always sort of pushing these spins down and that, that would be sensitive to stuff flowing in and that's called the inflow effect. 
And that's shown here where, for example, everything in, in the vessel is dark, but as stuff is flowing in, it's bringing in fresh, fresh magnetization. So you're sensitive to stuff that's flowing in. And so that's the concept here. You have repetitive RF pulses here that saturates the tissue. So all the tissue should become, you're, you're pushing down that magnetization, but stuff that flows in will now appear. And so if you do that, you get these really amazing, uh, what are called time of flight angiography. And this is sort of the standard method if you want to sort of very quick. You can get one of these in three or four minutes typically. Um, and you have these sort of really exquisite um, pictures of the vasculature in the brain. And the amazing thing is you can do this without injecting any contrast, right? So that's, that's the great part. Now, if you inject contrast, you can get even better images, but you only want to do that if you really have to, right? If you really felt like, oh, I really need better looking images. For most cases, for example, for research, there's no justification to inject contrast uh, for most people. So if you just want a picture and, of their vessels to sort of look at something, then you would use sort of non-contrast time of flight. Okay. okay, so that's all we're gonna say about that. So I'm just gonna spend the next about 15 minutes before we hit the noon hour, um, talking a little bit about, you know, where uh, sort of developments in MRI. So this is a, um, a diagram from a recent article looking at sort of the cost of MRI and sort of one of the biggest costs you can sort of see is the magnets and the cryogen. The gradient amps we've talked about, they're these really sort of strong amplifiers, huge amplifiers. And then the uh, gradient coils are also very expensive. I mean, everything is expensive, but these are the most expensive things. So, you know, typically the rule of thumb is uh, to buy an MRI system, it's a million dollars per Tesla. Okay. I don't mean the car, I mean the magnet. So a million dollars for a one Tesla magnet, three million dollars for three Tesla. The price can vary, but that's a good rule of thumb. So that means, uh, and this was from Siemens, so it's got Germany, it doesn't have the US in it, but basically it just shows that the amount of MRIs per capita does vary quite a lot. Okay, and so that means in terms of, it, if you think that the MRI is needed for healthcare, that there is actually quite a lot of disparity between countries in terms of um, you know where MRI is, and so there is sort of this thought of you know how do how do we make MRI more affordable? How do we sort of get it out there um, so more people can benefit from it? One thing that you can do is what's called cryogen-free MRI. So one of the disadvantages of these magnets is you have to have liquid helium, which is limited resource and very expensive, and requires a lot of sort of sophisticated technology to keep it there. Um, so there is this um, as there is this sort of especially for smaller magnets. So these are this is actually a very small magnet. This is about this big in terms of the open bore. The magnets may be this big overall. But what they've done is instead of having the cryogen in there, they have some advanced refrigeration systems so they can just pull the um, if the magnet is small enough, they can pull the heat off quickly enough to keep it cool. One of the advantages of, of having a cryogen free F MRI system is obviously you don't have to worry about the fluid in it, so you can tilt it in any direction you want. Okay. So that might have advantages for certain research projects. And you, the other advantage is it's much smaller. So this is this cryogen free, this is for looking for small animals, so it's not for humans. And then this is what the similar size. So see the bore size is the same, right? The size of the object you can put in is the same, but is this the one that has a lot of liquid helium in it, whereas this one does not. Um, how all these work, I don't know yet. These is relatively new, but it is sort of a trend. On the human side, I think we talked about this before. There's, for example, one version is the maximum free max, where it uses much less liquid helium, right? So 0 0.7 liters of liquid helium. Um, now this is a low field magnet, 0 0.55 Tesla. So um, for using cryogen free, I think, you know, half a Tesla, 1.5 Tesla is still sort of the, the maximum where it can be used and I, whether it can be scaled to higher field strength, I think is sort of an engineering question right now. So that's one thing that can be done is, is, is sort of going to, it's still using superconducting coils, but trying to find ways of getting rid of the liquid helium to save some money. And, and also, if you don't have to have liquid helium, it just makes everything much easier, okay? If you have to have liquid helium, you not only have to have space for the magnet, you also have to have a quench pipe, which can just dissipate the liquid helium in case there's an accident. 
Okay, so that means that, for example, we want to put a scanner in this room, we'd have to build some pipe that could dissipate the, the helium out in case there's an emergency. Okay. The other one um, that's gotten a lot of press these days is sort of a different approach, which is saying, well, you know, for a lot of MRI, you don't necessarily need the best looking image. You just need something good enough to see if something's wrong, right? So this is along the trends of what's called POC or point of care, which is let's not, let's, the business model here is if it's cheap enough, we have one of these at every CVS or Walgreens, right? You can walk into your Walgreens and get an MRI done, right? So this is, this is the, from Hyperfine, which is a startup company that's been getting a lot of press. Um, and so this is a magnet that is it's a low field magnet, so 64 millitesla. So much less than a Tesla. This is about, um, Earth scale is about 50 microtesla. This is 100 times the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, instead of being tens of thousands of times the magnetic field, it's only 100 times the Earth's magnetic field. And you can sort of see it's very portable. You just wheel it around, plug it in the wall. Um, and you know you can put babies, human, you know, adult, whatever. Okay. And one of the things that's making this possible is deep learning. So basically, because they don't have as much signal, they're using the deep learning to try to sort of get better image quality. And so you can sort of see here. This is before deep learning, and this is after deep learning. Okay. And so there is so there's a sort of interesting sort of um, merging now it's sort of two technologies, right? One is on the hardware side, how do you make things cheaper and more affordable? And then part of that is using deep learning to help with that, okay? Because as we saw in when we talked about deep learning, it means that you don't need as much data or if the data is not quite good enough, you can say, okay, that's fine, but the deep learning knows what input images look like. So it should have some chance of, of using, um, not having the best data. These are some images, um, just showing what the images look like off their um, scanner. Um, so this is like a T2 weighted. Unfortunately, this paper, they compare against things with different contrasts. So this is probably comparing this to this. Okay, this is the flare, right? So you can sort of see it's not as good. I don't see as much detail, but certainly for this person here, they're looking at hemorrhages um, in, this, in this subject. And so you can sort of see here, this, these are clearly, you know, on the T2 weighted, these are, there's clearly a lot of fluid here, right? That's going on, long T2 something. So clearly, um, you know, this is sufficient to tell that something's wrong with this person versus this is like the expensive MRI. Uh, this was just the abstract. I think I posted that basically showing that with this, they had like 80.4% sensitivity, 96.6% um, specificity. So the feeling is that this might be good enough for a lot of applications, okay? And the price is a lot cheaper, I think. I wanna say the price is probably 50,000, but I'm not, I'm not sure what it is. So it's, it's, it's basically, you know, like the price of a, of a car, like a Tesla car, right? Um, okay. um, some other things, um, anyone here know who Michael Crichton is? Yeah, who's Michael Crichton? Yeah, he's like, and anyone here know what Jurassic, have heard Jurassic Park? So it used to be there was these books and movies <laughs> in the 80s or 90s, like Jurassic Park was a big movie and stuff. So he was this guy who's a doctor who became a, uh, a novelist. And so what he said was that, you know, uh, in MRI, you don't need something this strong. We use squid devices, so, so sensitive, you can measure using just the Earth's magnetic field. We don't have any magnets in there. Okay. So um, this is sort of sci-fi, but there was a, a, a group at Berkeley who decided to, to sort of build something like that. So they built a very low field magnet and then they used these squid magnetometers. So these are just saying that, okay, the less the magnetic field, the less magnetization I have, but I have something that's really sensitive, then maybe I can get around that barrier. Right. So this is with 132 microtesla field. So this is only about 
two and a half times the Earth's magnetic field. So very, very small magnetic field, something you can build in your garage, okay? Um, and they were able to get pictures of, in this case, a, um, a bell pepper, okay? Uh, they were able, able, even able to get some images of brains, okay? Um, and this is what it looks like. So basically, um, the squids are up here and the person's brain goes up here. Um, I'm not sure this will really take off because squids obviously are, are a superconducting technology and they require care and feeding and things like that. So I'm not really sure that how far this will go given the fact that, you know, there's other technologies that are, are much more uh, easy to maintain. But I think it's an interesting idea to show how, how low you can go in field strength. Um, there's a group, a group at MIT that's sort of been pioneering sort of more portal MRI and, and this might be discussed in some of the, one of the projects. This was their initial attempt where they basically had uh, just permanent field magnets to create a magnetic field. And then instead of the gradient coil, because the field was non-uniform, they could just rotate it around to cause different, have gradients in different directions. Okay. So that's sort of like CT now, right? Basically, you're, you're sort of changing the gradients like that mechanically. For whatever reason, they gave, I, I don't think they've stuck with that design. I, I think it was limited. Another thing that they tried in that group was creating a magnet that you could just put on someone's head. Okay, sort of like sort of like a hair dryer sort of thing, or you might see in a hair salon. Um, and they built in special gradient coils and arc coils that all would be like a helmet shape. Okay. And their latest thing, which was just published this year, is going back to the more traditional design, where now they actually have the magnet and the gradient coil and the arc coil all sort of things. So I think. After they tried all those other designs, for whatever reason, they decided to go back to more traditional design. Um, but as you can sort of see here, so they're using permanent magnets here. So at least they don't have to have the superconducting. These are just sort of, you know, um, you know, sort of super duper versions of like your refrigerator magnet, right? So just a special uh, magnetic material. But you can sort of see here, if you look at the field, the field strength here is about, what is it? 80 millitesla. So it's Still, you know, about 100 times Earth's magnetic field, so fairly strong fields, and they're having a hard time getting it to be very uniform. Okay, so that means that on the reconstruction side, they're going to have a lot of issues because, you know, they, they've assumed that when we do MRI, we assume a lot of uniformity of the fields. Um, but if it's not uniform, then you put more load on the reconstruction. Okay, so the worse the hardware is, the more the software has to fix it. So in the old days, we would spend a lot of time getting the hardware really, really good, right? And so the reconstruction was relatively simple. But now with deep learning, it's sort of switching. We're saying, okay, let's make the hardware not so good, but cheaper, put more of the onus on the software, right? So these are some of the images I showed in the paper. You can sort of see they're, they're reasonable. They've still got some ways to go, but if they just, and they, they did a special recon for this, but you can sort of see if they compare it to just a normal recon, it's much better than this. These, these are really warped images here, okay? So they did a lot of work here and, and I imagine the next iteration of this will probably use some deep learning to make it even better. But just showing you how, where you spend your money and effort does vary as technologies come up, different technologies come on board. So I think for the future of medical imaging, um, there's still gonna be a lot of stuff on the hardware side, but there's also gonna be and need to understand what can you do, what can the software do? Okay. So with that, I'm just going to, we're gonna sort of sum up uh, this course now, and then we'll go into some course logistics in a minute. So um, there's been some questions about follow-up courses. So the, the two main follow-up courses for this course are uh, BNG 280B that this year, Professor McVeigh will teach in the spring quarter. Um, it's typically taught by Professor Kondigoff, but he, I think he'll be on leave. So that will cover things like PET imaging, optical imaging, ultrasound. So essentially the chapters in the prints and links books that we did not cover, it will touch upon them. That's a good sort of course to take if you want to round out your knowledge. BNG 278 is actually being offered winter. So I've sent out an announcement. There's actually a Zoom call today at four that you can join if you want to ask more questions about what that course is. Uh, typically this course has been all MRI. Um, this year, it's actually a little different. So uh, Dr. Wong is gonna pair with Dr. Kondigoff and it's gonna be about 
half MRI, half CT. Okay. These are lab courts. This is a lab course. So the cool thing is you'll actually get to go to the scanners and, and see what they look like, acquire data, um, and, um, and do things. Uh, they are very time intensive. Labs, as you know, tend to be very time intensive because you're actually acquiring real data. It's not just a little simulations, but I think if you really want to see what these machines do and, and get your hands dirty deeper, this is a great class. And there's not too many places in the world, I think, that really offer you know, hands-on labs like this. In terms of, we're lucky enough here that we have some research facilities where we can sort of support that, but um, otherwise it's, it's very difficult to get your hands on these systems. Okay. So any questions about what we've covered today in terms of material? Okay, so then what I'd like to do is just say a few words about the project. Um, so it will be in this room, um, although I need to make sure this room is available, but I'll, I'll double check. Uh, so next Tuesday, um, and um, the schedule is posted. So if there's any concerns about the schedule, just let me know. I think I've already shifted things around a little bit so we don't have too many topics the same next to next to each other. So there is some diversity there's about 15 minutes per group, so that's pretty good, and that still leaves us time for a break. So I think if you can sort of take that into account, you know, um, that'll be good. Uh, as with uh, the previous project, um, Professor McVeigh and I will be in this room, and but we'll also set up the Zoom. Um, so if you feel you need to zoom in, you can present it over Zoom. Um, if you're in person, then just make sure you're logged into Zoom. We will use the sharing feature of Zoom to um, save time because before that, we spent a lot of time sort of hooking up people's computers and it not working. So Zoom actually works really well for that. All right. Um, the project assignment portal is open. So you can, um, you know, you, so submit a version of your slides before the session starts. So at least we have that in case we need to, one of us, you know, we can display your slides from here. If there's a technical issue, you can submit other stuff like your code or whatever the supplement your stuff at that time or any time that day up until 5 p.m. It's really up to you. Um, and if there's any concerns about your project scope or um, you know whether you just want some feedback on the project, just just email me. I'm happy to give you feedback or answer additional questions. Right. Um, so I'll send an email just sort of summing that up. You know the day before. Uh, the presentation, but are there any questions now about the presentations? Okay, great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the last about 18 minutes. Um, if there's more questions, I'll answer them. Otherwise, uh, we've been asked to sort of leave some time for people, to, students to fill out evaluations. And so there are evaluations for both the instructors and the TAs. So we'd appreciate it if you sort of took some time now and, and filled those out. And I will stick around here uh, to answer any questions. All right.